welcome everybody to the 15th edition of the Salt Lunchbox. My name's Dave, I'm the founder of Salt Sport and Life Training. And we are not only uh, Zooming today, but we're going to Facebook Live, which has been another great platform to um, bring some numbers in. And we'd love for you to continue to let people know about this, this webinar. For those who don't know, SALT normally is in sporting clubs, but of course we're not doing that at the moment, but we're using this time to develop a stronger, uh, more capable and expansive SALT for the future. The aim of this lunchbox is to inspire and connect. We'd hope that you can go away from every one of these with a, a really practical action point. We make sure that we've always got um, three main takeaways and something for you to do, to anchor to a, a tool to, to use. We would love for you to connect during this webinar um, through the um, icon at the bottom, the Q&A or, or the chat and make it available for all people or all panelists and attendees to see what you're saying. Um, if Les Twentyman is out there and you are going to be talking about the 1970 grand final again and talking about Peter McKenna and Ted Hopkins, uh, maybe keep that for a, another forum as interesting as it was and as a Carlton supporter. I did enjoy reading what you had to say. We would like to thank our sponsors, Eastland, Bendigo Bank and FC Business Solutions. Without all three of those organisations, we wouldn't be able to be bringing this to you. So before we start also, we've been working on our, what we called our wellbeing and mental health course for clubs that's going to go online as of next week. We're calling it Club Reconnect. It's going to be very uh, much about getting through the current times that we're in and some of the really specific issues that we're facing. And we're going to use the live quiz to find out what's happening in your club and how can we set our clubs up so that when you come back, you're ready and prepared for what is actually going to be quite a crisis in regard to mental health for a lot of people. So um, that's something we'd love you to avail yourselves of. I'll have a slide up about that at the end. Today, we're going to hear from Corin Jacker on the topic of money. You know, I read in the paper this morning that around about a million Australians are now unemployed. And we still have a lot of people too who are employed, but will be fearful of what might happen when JobKeeper runs out or if their companies, you know, fail to be able to adapt to the new environment. Corin has over 20 years of experience in the field of financial advice. He's an independent advisor since 2012, so he doesn't get paid to sell somebody else's product. He also sits on the AFCA Ombudsman Complaints Resolution Panel, which does sound like a fun night out, Corin. And when he's not talking about money, he focuses on home brewing, sourdough mastery, and harmonica playing. I've actually seen him on Facebook. It's like MasterChef. He talks about making sourdough and he's got it all set up in his kitchen and uh, I never knew there was that aspect to Corin. And in his work he focuses on improving financial decisions so that people can enjoy more things in life and improve well-being. So he's got a very holistic attitude towards money. Welcome Corin. Are you there Corin? How are you? Good, there he is. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for the introduction. No worries. How's the harmonica playing going? Badly. <laughs> how's the uh, how's the uh, sourdough mastery going? No, I enjoyed it. I've been doing that for a few years. I've been doing the home roof for probably coming up to three decades now. Ooh. I've only been doing the harmonica bit for a little bit, but um, that's part of my uh, mental health release. Terrific. Well, let's get straight into it. Tell us, how did you get into financial planning to begin with? Coaching Dave, um, when I was in Canberra, I did sports administration at Canberra Uni and part of that I was doing um, strength and conditioning coaching through the Australian Institute of Sport. So my first role was working in gyms, fitness facilities, writing programs, helping people achieve their goals physically. Um, I moved on and fell into a job in the one of the big four banks and I was a training officer for financial planners in Victoria. So it was about 70 to 80 planners. And again, the job was to coach and educate and assist them with running their own businesses within the, the suite of the bank. Uh, I then moved into financial planning myself. And the role there is simply just to, again, help people 
understand where they're heading in relation to their objectives and goals and then creating that discipline and accountability like any coach would in any aspect of life to help them get there. So it's, it's been a coaching role is where I've come from. No, I like that. Look, before we go any further, let's welcome in Lane as well, or welcome back Lane. For those who don't know, Lane is the chairman of SALT. He is also um, the founder uh, of Yellow Box Careers, and he also works as a director at Roses in the Ocean. Are you with us, Lane? Yeah, hi, Dave. Thank you, mate. It's good to be back, and I'm glad I got a little intro there. I was a bit jealous of Corin's introduction. He was the, the tyres were well and truly pumped up. I'm really interested in what corin has got to say today because, um, you know, from a yellow box careers perspective, we're, we're talking to a lot of people who are feeling really um, anxious, not only anxious about uh, not having any money at the moment, but anxious about what the future is going to hold. And in some cases, really catastrophizing uh, the potential to lose everything. And yep. so there's a lot of worry and a lot of concern out there at the moment. So really interested in what corin has got to say. So tell us, Corin, about... Um finances and, and mental health and how during this particular pandemic, all of us, no matter what, I guess, financial situation we're in currently can either help ourselves or help those that we know who might be struggling to get through this time. Okay, Dave. Um, well, first of all, there's obviously the well publicised and promoted packages that are available to those who have been affected. Um, so I'll just quickly run through those. I won't spend too much time on them. But obviously, there's a couple of key points, I think, where you've got the job keeper and the job seeker. So the job keepers for the employers, um, that's probably been surrounded by a bit more controversy and complexity. There's a lot of employers who are just saying it's, it's difficult. Um, so I encourage people who are running their businesses or employees who have employers who haven't gone down this path to, to pursue it because we're getting a lot of people who are getting through um, despite some initial difficulties and there is those payments available. Um, for employees, there's the job seeker allowance, obviously if your employer is not available for the job keeper. Um, so again, um, if, you're, if your hours have been reduced or you've been affected by this, there's a highly likelihood you'd be able to get that payment. Um, a lot of people don't like dealing with things like Centrelink, um, but from the clients I've seen deal with it, uh, it's coming through. It, it's been processed relatively well and, and they're, they're getting the payments. So get those entitlements. That's probably the key point there is make sure you're getting what you're entitled to. Um, particularly with businesses who are small businesses, sole traders. Um, we've got a lot of clients who are, you know, a sole trading carpenter, for example, who um, has lost their, their work because they do a lot of residential work. Um, they didn't realise they were entitled to anything, but they were. They are entitled to the job keeper payment. So, for a small business like that, make sure you're speaking to your accountant to make sure that they're on top of things. The second one, which is probably wrapped up in a bit more controversy, is the access to superannuation. Um, most people are probably aware you can get access to a tax-free amount of super of ten thousand dollars now and ten thousand dollars after July. I see this as probably a source of money for a last resort. I'm concerned that people are seeing this as an opportunity to get money that they wouldn't have otherwise got access to, to do things they don't really need to do. Uh, there was an interview I saw on, on TV the other day where someone was saying they're looking at getting access to it because they want to finish doing the deck outside. Um, I think you've got to use it for what it's designed for, which is to, to cover the bills. Um, the research indicates that if you're in your 50s and you take out $20,000, you're probably going to be 30 to 40,000 less in retirement. And if you're in your 20s, taking out $20,000, it could be up to $200,000 less. So you really want to think twice about whether you need to do it or not. Now I've got a client um, to just give you some perspective of how these are all coming together. So we had a client who's on around $100,000, um, which is a reasonable income, but he's the sole income earner of a family with teenage kids. They've got a mortgage, uh, they've got education costs, they've got the normal family expenses. So he's been stood down, um, uh, hopefully only temporarily, that the, the business is a larger business that will hopefully come back on board when the, the economy starts coming on board, he is in a situation where now though he's $100,000, he's 
the job keeper equates to forty thousand dollars a year. So that's a significant difference. So in that case, he's going to need to speak to his bank about deferral of loan repayments. He's going to take out the superannuation and put it there in the bank just in case. But the intention is when he gets through, he's going to make the effort to make sure we get that money back in to the superannuation environment. So if you're going to take it out, have a plan in place to get it back in when things are looking a bit better. Now I touched on then uh, the last couple of things about what's going on is the, the banks are obviously all offering a deferral of loan repayments. And again, probably the, the, the main thing I'd like to make sure people are aware of is it's a deferral of repayments. You're still gonna to have to pay this back. So again, if you can keep the payments up, if you're still working, then do so, because all you're doing is just accumulating a larger debt that you're gonna to have to pay off down the track. Um, and I think the same is with rental uh, negotiation. That's a probably a, a lot more complicated area. That's a government sort of left people to their own devices to negotiate solutions there. So I can understand that there's going to be a lot of problems in that space. Um, but again, if you can continue paying rents, probably still do it because it's just usually a deferral exercise unless the landlord's generous enough to, to stop payments for a while. So that's probably all I wanted to touch on in, in relation to the, to the stimulus package side of things. Um, probably the next thing that I wanted to talk on, and we'll probably elaborate this as we go through the conversation, is, is just what's happening with people's investments. Um, most people, their, their, their largest form of wealth outside the home is the superannuation. Now, for most people, that's been uh, significantly affected, even in more conservative profiles, it's still been significantly affected. Uh, so I think we need to understand the view we need to take with that kind of investment. It's usually a long-term investment. So even if you've just retired, most people are looking at this kind of investment with a 10, 20, 30 or 40 year time frame, And you have to view it within that lens. And I think the main thing then is that you don't want to react to short-term volatility. The only time you want to react and make changes to your investments is a change in your circumstances. And that way you can make an irrational, a rational informed decision about what's going on. Um, but I'll touch on, I'll touch on the, the view of investments and the possible paths perhaps down the track. I think what I wanted to touch on, Dave, is, is what you alluded to before is, is where money fits in to the overall lifestyle of someone's position. Um, and I think, and this sounds a bit odd coming from a financial advisor, but I think people get money in the wrong order of what's important. Um, money is an enabler to do what we want to do, but it's only to a certain extent. The more money we have doesn't equate to more happiness. And I think a lot of people focus on the money itself rather than why they're getting that money in the first place. Um, and one of the things that we've seen in the past is that the statistics of being around 25 to 30% of adults in Australia suffer from higher levels of stress, anxiety or depression. And 49% of those, the number one reason for that stress was finances. Um, now, Lane, you're probably good to comment more in this space, but that statistic that I just mentioned, that was before what's happening now. Um, what do you think is going on in relations to people's stress, anxiety and depression, and where finance sits into it all in the current environment? Yeah, mate, it's a, a great question. And I, I, I'm a bit concerned about where this is all going, to be entirely honest. Uh, you know, uh, was it the, the latest statistic tells us that uh, around about 5 million Australians uh, took out prescriptions for medication due to health-related issues 2018-19. Uh, that was pre-COVID environments and that was when we had fairly normal, actually pretty strong, robust economic conditions. Now you think about the impact that this has had on people's mental health. My major concern is that we haven't seen the ramifications from a mental health perspective uh, yet and we're not likely to see the full extent of what's going to happen for another 12 months. People who are talking to me are talking about things like suicidal ideation, 
Uh, they're talking about, you know, not being able to sleep. They're talking about, you know, physically feeling unwell. They're talking about high levels of anxiety. They're talking about relationship breakdowns. You know, to your point, it's the number one thing in relationship breakdowns, uh, closely followed by how to bring up children. So, you know, we've got this perfect storm of mental health related forces that I think are going to have really significant impacts. And at the forefront of that is going to be the issue around money, I think. Okay, can I just in intervene there too? And um, earlier, Corin, you and I were talking about some of those recent happiness studies that have been done in Australia. And while I can't quite necessarily exact numbers from memory, it was something like if you're a family and you earn under $80,000, you're going to struggle to pay bills and you're not going to have a whole lot of margin in what you do. But then, and again, I could have the figures wrong. It was some time back, but if you earned anywhere between 80 and 120, then it started to build that, that um, margin into your life and you could have a, a few more of, of the things that you might need, but anything over 120, it could be 2 million meant that there was no actual increase in happiness. And so I think sometimes there's, a stress that says, um, you know, we're not going to be able to, to live and do the things that we need to do. But in actual fact, quite likely, we can do those things on a lot less than we've realised. And Corin, earlier you were talking about, you know, people who retire and, and some have the expectation that they need, you know, $100,000 a year to live on, but others live really comfortably on thirty or $40,000. So again, I guess it comes down to perspective, doesn't it, as to what we really need and what we want and, and recognising that, Yes, it can be hard financially, but actually in the long run, we're probably going to be okay. I'll just throw to you guys there, either one of you. Yeah, I think, thanks, Dave. Um, what we've found in, in, a, in a relation to that research is that in, t in terms of the finance position being a stress catalyst, uh, I think the, the main reason for that is a, a lack of understanding and knowledge about finances. So it's purely a financial literacy issue to begin with. I think a lot of people, once they understand a bit more about financial literacy and understand you know, everything from budgeting, income versus expenses, uh, basically how, how banking products work, how credit cards work, how loans work. Once they get an understanding of how they work, they can actually take a little bit more control of it. Now, it won't equate to an immediate improvement in their financial position, but they can understand more to make informed choices and hopefully, therefore, smarter choices. Mm. So I think that's the first thing that we focus on. And it's only been recently now that even financial literacy is, is being put into schools in any meaningful way. And even that's not a great solution at this stage. But I think that's the first thing that people can take control of is getting their financial literacy improved. And there's lots of resources out there from books to, to internet sites that can help improve that. So the first thing is you understand then what your current position is. The second thing I think that, that again, people lose track of is that they just think more money, as you said, Dave, is going to lead to, to what they, to the happiness that they're after. And that is not the case. So I think for some people, it's, it's, it's a good idea to, to take stock and, and reset what their actual real goals and objectives are. So why are they doing what they're doing? And I think this kind of forced change that's been put upon us, where all our lives have changed to, to some degree, um, it's probably not a bad time to sit back and go, okay, what is actually really important? I think that's when you can start to ascertain, well, what's really important doesn't actually require massive amounts of money. Um, mm. One of those researchers on those studies indicate that the focus for a lot of people to, on spending money that they think is going to make them happier is material goods. So people buy the TVs, the big houses, the fancy cars, the expensive clothes, thinking that that's going to be the next step that makes them happy. And it doesn't. It doesn't make any difference. And in fact, the research shows the more they do it, the happiness starts to decrease because obviously the stress related to it is increasing. Um, the, the, usually the, the money spent on experiences and memories is what's, what generates happiness. And I think and what people can do from this is to, to sit down and go, okay, what, what are those sort of things that I want to achieve in life? 
and what money does that require and then focus on that because also the journey to that is a lot more satisfying because you're really going to journey towards something that is going to create an improvement in your happiness rather than a bigger house or a more expensive car or fancy clothes. Mm. Corin, I've got, a, I've got a quick question, maybe, because um, I think what, we're, what we, we've got at the moment is two things coming together, which are, are, are really interesting for me. One is the, the buy now, pay later mentality of the, of the millennials and the, the Gen Ys, where uh, I can get access to everything I want right now and, and I don't have to worry about the overall cost of it. And when you're, when, when you're seeing that take off stratospherically, and at the same time, we've got an emerging recession uh, that's, that's going to require people to actually really tighten up the belts. And we're talking about millions of people being unemployed potentially. How do we, you know, what's the advice that we give to particularly younger people who, who may not have experienced this? People like Dave and I have been through a couple of recessions. So we kind of understand what needs to happen. But for those who have never experienced it before, interest rates at 18% and all sorts of really complex things happening. What advice do you give to this younger generation right now? Hmm. Live within the means, isn't it? Um, and I know that's very hard for many people because we've been given so much easy credit for so long. And those, those buy now, pay later ones are just an extension of the, the credit cards of, of years gone by. And it's all been the same marketing strategies to try and uh, market to people to say, yeah, have it now, pay for it later, and, and you, it'll, it'll make your life happier, and it doesn't. And, you know, we've had the store loans of the past where we had people on an interest-free loan for a period of time, and then all of a sudden the interest starts kicking in, and they're paying twice as much for an old, what is now an old couch um, when they first got it. So, you know, I'd like to really see people go back to that basic budgeting of, of looking at what they're spending, what's important, what's not, saving for things and buying things when you've got the money. Um, and when you use credit, you only want to use credit for something that's going to appreciate in value. So nothing wrong with taking out a home loan. That's a long-term investment in an asset that's going to appreciate in value. But outside that, things like cars and furniture and clothes, and look, to be honest with you, even holidays, I mean, I, I've seen the, the ads on the TV with the, the payday lending to get your $5,000 or $10,000 and it shows them magically appearing in, in a tropical resort. Um, yeah, you'll, you might enjoy that for the week or two that you're there, but the cost of that then and the pressure that that then puts on the family when you're back is just not worth it. You're much better off to save for it and then use it for those things. So. I think the things that don't appreciate in value, save for um, and use the credit for things that appreciate in value. Mm. I think it's really important too that people who are listening who are parents start to have these financial literacy conversations with their kids. I think there was a time where you know, people looked at our generation and, and said you, you were too money focused and, and we probably were. Um, and the, a, a younger generation have said, you know, we're going to be kind of free of all of that and we're not, we're not going to be dictated to by finances and we're going to go and enjoy our money and enjoy our lives. And on Friday, when I talk about stress, I'm going to talk about good stress and bad stress and holding that tension where actually you do have to invest some knowledge in some of these things like your bank loans and, and your, your super and, and so on, but, but not take it so to heart that money drives you. And I, I think finding that balance you know, perhaps one generation swings too far one way and another generation swings too far the other. But perhaps we just need to have more of those conversations around the table without them being kind of lectures, but just real conversations on the outcomes that happen in the, in the longer term when, we, you know, we don't have that little nest egg or that little buffer in our lives. Yeah, it's ironic, Dave, that you mentioned the, the, the comment that they don't want to be dictated to by, you know, financial institutions the reality is they may not be dictated to in that situation, they'll be controlled by them, right? Um, so when you've got those high levels of debts, you, you, are, you, you are restricted then in what you can do. So the whole point of having freedom becomes a complete restriction because you have to work long hours and you have to spend time away from your family and your loved ones because you've taken on this debt for something that's happened in the past. So I think it is a bit of a a false paradise, I think, that, that argument. Um, and in terms of parents talking to, to kids, we, we do some financial literacy 
um, in secondary school for one of our programs, and it's mainly around the year 10 and year 11 students. And one of the um, messages that we take away is, is when they start work, so a lot of these kids, you know, they're getting part-time jobs and they're, they're starting a little bit of money. We sort of try to have them remember a couple of rules of thumbs. And, and we've always said that if you're, if you're saving for something and you don't have any debt at the moment, so typically 15 or 16 year olds shouldn't, then try and save at least 20% of your wage. If you've got debt, pay the debt, but also still save 10% of your wage. And I've said to kids that age, if you're at that age and you're living from home, you should be saving almost 50% of your wage and start doing it from day one. And if they do that for the rest of their lives, they won't have to do anything else particularly special or advanced in their financial planning. They'll end up being very comfortable, but it's just creating that discipline from that very young age to just put the money aside, pay, pay that yourself later, and then you spend what's left and live within those means. Mm. Con, this has been really practical and really helpful. We've got four minutes to go. So I'm going to throw to you, Lane, anything else to add, particularly around if you do around the mental health space. I've been looking at the comments coming in and, uh, and James, our moderator is, is answering some terrific questions that are, that are coming in. But just before we uh, get towards the end, Lane, any other comments? No, nothing, nothing else, mate. I, I do love that, that idea of financial literacy. I know that, um, you know, my father never really sat down with me and had those kinds of conversations. It wasn't the way that things were done. So I grew mm -hmm. up with a very narrow view of money and, and uh, probably a really, um, poor view of, of how money actually worked and it took me a long time to actually work out how to use money in the in the right way and I'm trying to pass that on to my kids now to give them those opportunities so you know I'd encourage parents to read you know things like Barefoot Investor and, mm -hmm. and other books like that that are really simple ways you know Rich Dad Poor Dad all these simple books that I only got to read in my 30s that I probably should have read when I was a lot younger mm -hmm. uh, which could have set me up for uh, you know for a better financial position as I get a bit older. Right. I'm going to just um, share my screen um, and take it home. So three takeaways from today. Take a long-term view with your investments. Continue payment commitments and preserve superannuation if you can. And understand the link between financial literacy and mental health. We've, we've got to know enough to um, make some good decisions. And the call to action today is be engaged with your current financial situation and create a plan for your money. On Friday, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my own experience in this where I, I took no interest in our, our super until somebody um, took it away from me and put it into a self-managed fund that he was managing and kind of lost it all. And then I had to take an interest in this particular space. It was a stress that brought about in the longer run a, a good outcome. Um, when we talk about stress next week, we're going to talk on Friday about people who handle stress in, in the way that, that Lane handles stress. And who did that? Seriously. <laughs> at, the beginning, at the beginning of COVID, I looked like that. But as we come to the end, I'm starting to look like that. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, I'm still around with that. But on Monday, let me just say, uh, we have a very, very special guest. And we want to really promote this. Dr. Zach Siedler clinical psychologist, researcher, and leading expert in men's mental health. He's the director of mental health training at Movember, research fellow with Origin and the University of Melbourne. I was talking to him yesterday. I wished I'd had two hours. He's going to talk about the situational stress that we're under right now. It's different to depression and anxiety, where we talk about things like hopelessness and helplessness. It's, it's a different reaction that people are having around anger and irritability. Um, how right now we have this divine opportunity to reach out like we never have before and no excuse because this is a shared experience and he's going to talk about the fact that men often are categorized as having to be shoulder to shoulder before they can have these conversations and that actually they don't they're much better at this or we're much better at this than we realize so it's going to be called conversations uh, from a kind of a male perspective and how we can really help each other uh, we men and, and women in our lives uh, to get through this pandemic so that's exciting. Thank you again, obviously, to our partners who we love and, um, and, and couldn't do this without. If you've missed this session or any others, go to our website and link into the YouTube channel that will enable you to, to catch up on any of the sessions that we've had. I spoke earlier about the, uh, the Club Wellbeing or the Reconnect program, as we're going to call it, and 
Uh, I've seen some emails coming in just to the side that clubs are starting to book in. So again, we won't have unlimited capacity for this. But if you'd like to have a session, we have some funding available for many clubs to, uh, to cover costs, particularly initially. It won't be that way for the longer run. That's the number from Lifeline. Uh, we had some feedback from people who said, we like to keep these at half an hour. We like that you put up the Lifeline. We like that they're concise and that you, there's not too much white noise. So we're going to keep it to half an hour. Uh, I really want to thank you very much, Corin, and thank you, Lane, and thank you, James. And thank you, everybody, for being a part of what we had to share today. So remember, we will get through this time stronger, better, richer in the things that really matter. That's relevant for our talk today. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe. Stay connected. We'll see you on Friday.